So again, quickly, this is going to be uh, <clears throat> a couple of things that I'd just kind of like to go over uh, to point out. One is what makes isotopes so wonderful is that they trace the element that we're interested in and the concentrations are so small that they don't actually change the properties of the system. Okay, so there, an ideal tracer is one that doesn't actually change the way the system works. So let's imagine there's, okay, there's this big race going on on the island of man, okay, where they zoom around the island at 200 miles an hour on motorcycles and kill themselves. Okay, well, let's just say that you wanted to trace how to do this, and so you go out there on your bicycle to help them and watch and you're going to trace the progress. Well, your presence is going to affect the race, okay? You're not going 200 miles an hour like those guys. <clears throat> so what makes isotopes wonderful is that, to my, in my mind, they trace the element of interest. Their concentrations are so small that they don't actually change the properties of the system. Now, <clears throat> for the isotopes that we are considering, for the natural separation of isotopes. It helps when we have the low atomic mass. So if the delta M, okay, the difference in the isotope mass compared to the total mass is large, uh, that's where we get our largest isotope separations in nature, okay? So for instance, deuterium and hydrogen, how, what's the, what's the, the mass of deuterium? Two, and the mass of hydrogen? One. So we have one mass unit, and our abundant isotope is one, so it's basically 100% mass difference. So one is twice as heavy as the other. So that's an easy isotope separation to get. Oxygen 18 compared to 16, that's a 10% difference. That's certainly enough of a difference that if you'd pick up a, a box of your, your, if you're moving your friend up to an apartment that's on a fourth floor flat with no, no lifts, yeah, you can tell the difference between 27 pounds and 24 pounds, and you're going to leave your friends to carry all the heavy boxes up while you take the slightly lighter boxes, okay? Um, so there's a large mass difference and a large mass difference between the rare and the common isotopes. Covalent bonds tend to show more isotope separation than ionic bonds. Oxidation state is incredibly important. Okay, big change in oxidation, any change in oxidation state is important. A big change in oxidation state results in bigger isotope effects, like carbon going from minus four to plus four, as it does with, in the case of uh, uh, methane to CO2. It has a huge isotope effect. Sulfur, reduced versus oxidized sulfur, huge isotope effects. Uh, High vapor pressure, so compounds with high vapor pressure is a good way to make isotope separations, okay? So ammonia, for instance, with nitrogen 15 compared to nitrogen 14, the heavy nitrogen uh, stays behind, the light nitrogen essentially boils away. So we get big isotope effects where we have high vapor pressure. Water has a high vapor pressure, okay? <clears throat> This is interesting. Fluorine is the only element that has only one naturally occurring isotope, stable or radioactive. Okay? okay, I said that we, you know, there's not a lot of stable isotopes. There's only 260 or so, uh, but there's a lot of isotopes. For in, so, for instance, uh, um, there's some elements that have only one naturally occurring stable isotope, beryllium nine sodium-23, phosphorus-34, but there are a bunch that have, some of these have short-lived cosmogenic isotopes. So beryllium-7 and beryllium-10 are made by cosmic rays, and they're made in the atmosphere, and they can trace things around, we can use those to trace things around the landscape. Beryllium-7 is a half-life of 53 days. So if we find it, it had to have come down in the rain less than, say, a year ago, because that's almost 10 half-lives. So we have only about a year to find it. Beryllium-10 has a half-life of millions of years, so that's easy to find. Sodium-22, half-life of a few days, but that's enough that we can find it. Phosphorus-32 and 33. Really, uh, remember Devondra Lal said, well, that's really neat because every time it rains, 
The oceans are labeled, the surface is labeled with phosphorus 32 and 33. And it has a really short half-life. It's used a lot in biology as a tracer where they, you know, use it to trace phosphorus. But he said, well, let's look at the natural, the natural tracers. Every time it rains, we label the oceans with phosphorus 32 so we can actually see where organisms are using phosphorus. The only problem is you got to somehow collect, you know, like 10 tons of seawater uh, and then extract all of the phosphorus through it. So in his usual way, Lal you know, gets a heroic graduate student to, to figure out a way to do this. And oceanographers love to do this, um, heroic things. Uh, <coughs> lead-210 is actually a, radi it's a, a radioisotope. It's produced in the radioactive decay scheme. Uh, but ultimately, it's, it's released when radon gas undergoes radioactive decay about an hour later, you tra you, you, wherever that radon was, you have uh, lead-210. And so lead-210, again, is a tracer of things happening in the atmospheric process. And it is a half-life of 22 years. And so, again, in the geological sciences, we use it for all kinds of things. So always remember that there are other isotopes out there that sometimes you can use for something really cool and interesting, even though it's not a stable isotope. So I just don't want you to forget that those isotopes, they're, they're your friends, okay? Just figure out how to talk to them. Okay, <clears throat> you probably all should be familiar with the isotope terminology. This goes back to a paper in uh, 1950 by, uh, by uh, Charles McKinney and a group uh, at University of Chicago. And uh, basically we measure the ratio of of carbon-13 to carbon-12 in something, okay? And we compare it to a standard. And remember that this is about 1.1 divided by 98.9 divided by something that is also is almost 1.1 divided by 98.9. So it's two numbers almost identical in value. And so we just divide them by each other. So they're going to be really close to 1, because it's 1 point something divided by 99 divided by 1 point something else divided by 99. And so we just subtract 1, multiply by 1,000, and call that difference in per mil parts per 1,000. Now, why do we do this? Um, it was really only until about 1975 or 1980 that we could actually truly know the absolute abundances of the isotopes. So the beauty of this method was that um, we didn't need to know the absolute values. We needed to know the ratios. It's much easier to accurately measure a ratio of something than the absolute values. Okay? And you'll become more and more familiar with that, especially if you're interested in this when you talk to Craig and Brad and... Shavankar as to why it's so difficult to measure an absolute value compared to a ratio. But what this meant was that we had 25 years at least of head start on using isotopes in natural systems before we could actually measure the absolute ratios. Uh, and it represents a very convenient terminology. So on Earth, carbon-13 ranges from about 1.04 to 1.14%. Okay, and this, in this per mil notation, is about minus 65 per mil to about plus 25 per mil. So our isotope playing field is about 100 per mil. Okay, and it's very easy to measure, really easy to measure to plus or minus 1 per mil. Uh, you just need to moderate care to measure to 0.1 per mil, and a lot of work to measure to 0 0.1 per mil. Okay. <coughs> And uh, so we've got, a, we've got a nice playing field. And then we do these for all of the isotope, um, isotope values. Okay? So that's our per mil notation. Um, here's our, the, the breadth of our playing field. And this is the natural ranges for planet Earth. Okay? That does not include Mars, does not include meteorites, does not include the moon. If we open up those, then these some of these become much, much, much greater. Okay? So we've got 600 per mil at least for deuterium, 
100 per mil for carbon, oxygen, sulfur, 30 per mil for nitrogen. Nitrogen is a particularly interesting one too because if we just involve, uh, allow normal manufacturing processes like take place in pharmaceutical industry, fertilizer industry, and so on, then this opens up basically to 100 per mil. Okay. So it's easy to find um, large isotope ratios. And nitrogen 15 is actually, there's a bunch of people who will, you can actually purchase pure nitrogen 15 that's made, and then you have these artificial trace experiments, and lordy, 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 keep those away from my lab and Jim's lab. Okay, and anybody you want to talk to the next day. Okay, if they run a regular lab, keep these spiked things far, far, far away. Right? Is that Diane back there still? No. Okay. Well, you, you'll take them in your lab? You'll take not pure nitrogen 15? Please don't bring pure. We have a parallel hot lab. Right, see, right. So, uh, and, and, and I, I say this because every once in a while, somebody will submit something to the surfer lab, and we say, what in the world did you do? And they say, oh, yeah, well, you know, somebody did something next door, and I didn't think it would affect my stuff. And, oh, well, you have an experiment that you didn't know you did. <coughs> Good luck figuring it out, but you still got to pay us the money. <coughs> okay, how do we get isotope differences? Um, okay, you all remember this in third grade? What? Third grade, okay. A moles of A goes to B moles of B, goes to C moles of C, and D moles of D. And uh, <coughs> that's La Chatelier's principle. You stress one side of the reaction, it goes the other direction. And at equilibrium, okay, at equilibrium, we can write this as an equilibrium constant. Okay? Equilibrium constant is K, goes to this value. And these are so associated with a free energy of a reaction, which I'm sure you got that by fourth grade. Uh, so the, the change in the energy of the reaction is related to this same K, okay? Now there's a couple of important um, issues here, and one uh, will play out as we get into further nuances on some of our descriptions. Is the field of isotope study of natural abundances started out basically through physical chemistry. And in physical chemistry, everything was based on equilibrium exchange reactions, okay? And um, so we're actually looking at these. We can extend these to non-equilibrium, non-reversible reactions, uh, but we just remember there's a price to be paid uh, for that, especially if you aren't paying attention. All right, so here's a couple of exchange reactions. This is vapor water with oxygen 16, liquid water with oxygen 18, and we're just exchanging the oxygen 18, so on the, this side now it's in the vapor, and the oxygen 16 is in the liquid. So our equilibrium constant then is K, this is the products divided by the reactants, okay, we can combine these terms and we can see, oh, this is really just the 18 to 16 ratio in the vapor divided by the 18 to 16 ratio in liquid, okay? So this is an equilibrium constant ratio to vapor. And we will call this special isotope exchange reaction alpha, okay? So again, the original definition for alpha is an equilibrium reaction and this represents, uh, this represents an equilibrium situation where this is, that reaction is going on, okay? And this simplifies, there, there's just another caveat. If we have different exchange sites, uh, we have to raise this to a power, which you would see if you had this reaction with a, with a more comp, com, complex um, situation. But this case, we just have one. Um, in carbon dioxide, it's just a one because it's a symmetrical molecule. So the two different oxygens in 
CO2 or the two different hydrogens in water are perfectly symmetrical and so those sites are indistinguishable. <coughs> okay, <coughs> so the other thing that we know is that in, again, going back to our original chemistry, uh, heat of reactions, okay, play a role in the Gibbs free energy of an exchange reaction. And again, I know you guys had this in first through sixth grade, okay? But the key thing is that if the, the change in the heat of reaction over temperature space is not zero, then alpha is a function of temperature. This means these exchange reactions must be functions of temperature. So every single one has a built-in thermometer. And this is what made this so attractive to geologists in the, starting in 1950 with Harold Urey, is we had an actual thermometer that's built into our minerals, okay? Because always in the past we, you know, had tried, well, we're try, always trying to figure out thermometers, pressure sensitive indicators, and so on. And <clears throat> here's uh, just, again, this is the um, Clausius-Clapeyron equation, the natural log of K over one over T is a straight line with a slope of minus delta H over R. And that means that our equilibrium constant, okay, has this kind of a form, okay. This, this is the instantaneous slope. And over a large temperature range, and I mean large like 300 degrees Celsius, uh, this actually is a very slight curve, okay. But the, um, the, the instantaneous tangent to the line is minus delta H over R at any point. So we have this heat capacity equation or a form of a heat capacity equation that describes the temperature dependence. So all equilibrium isotope exchange reactions, and again I'm emphasizing equilibrium exchange reactions, have this form. <coughs> 